Ok, maximum effort. The year was 2014, and for the first time in a decade, the King of the Monsters was hitting theaters worldwide. But this time he was once again being handled by an American production company. Legendary Pictures Godzilla was a commercial success, prompting Warner Bros., the film's distributor, to almost immediately greenlight a sequel. That year was also the franchise's 6th anniversary, and the celebration of this milestone combined with the new movie's release meant a lot of people were discovering or rediscovering the long-running franchise. It was a most important time for the character, to be sure. And Toho, of course, took notice of the fact. That's why, in December of that same year, the Japanese studio announced that they had started development of a new Godzilla movie, aiming for a 2016 release date. This was not to mean that this movie came into existence in the few months since the American Godzilla's release. As early as January 2013, there was the interest in Saito of reviving the franchise, with the studio approaching director Hideaki Anu to helm the project, which Anu, being the perpetual sad boy that he is, declined. You could even say he didn't want to pilot the giant robot that is the Godzilla franchise, huh? Huh? Like and subscribe if you got the shitty joke. Anyway, it took some convincing from his friend and future co-director Shinji Higuchi, but Anu eventually agreed to co-helm and write the flick. For the next two years, the director would pen the script for the project, which would officially enter production mid-2015 and eventually be revealed to have the title Shin Gojira. By the way, I will talk about the 2014 Godzilla someday. I'm saving it for a Monsterverse retrospective once the series has ended. Hideaki Anno was, of course, most famous as the creator of the anime series Neon Genesis Evangelion, which actually shows. Higuchi, on the other hand, had previously been special effects director for the Heisei Gamera trilogy and later helmed the Attack on Titan live-action films. Also from Evangelion would be brought on board composer Shiru Sagizu, which also shows... And producing the movie would be not Shogo Tomiyama actually, since he has pretty much stopped producing films after a brief period as president of Toho, making this the very first Godzilla movie not to be produced either by Tomoyuki Tanaka, father of the franchise, or by Tomiyama, who was handpicked by Tanaka to oversee the series after his departure. Anu approached the project knowing fully well that, if he wanted to succeed in making a good product, he would have to go back to the creature's origin. That's why Shin completely ignores the events of the original Godzilla from 1954, the first film in the franchise to do so, opting to tell a completely new story of humanity's first encounter with a beast born from radiation. Not only the origin of the character was revisited, but also its inspiration. If in the 1950s Godzilla was a stand-in for the nuclear bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, 
and the Daigo Fukuri Maru incident, in 2016, the monster represents the 2011 earthquake and Fukushima nuclear disaster. And the movie very visibly evokes the event from those fateful days of March 2011. Whether it's with the ominous wave of water and the breeze that Godzilla brings to land, whether it's with the masses of homeless civilians having to be rushedly evacuated from Tokyo, or just the path of destruction left by the creature. Not satisfied with just visually reconstructing those traumatizing events though, it also attempts to take a look at the series of human errors that led to the biggest nuclear disaster since Chernobyl. That's why, rather unusually for the franchise, we spend most of the time watching government officials as they talk around ways of dealing with the crisis. While there have been movies in the franchise with a heavy focus on the politics of such a catastrophe, this was usually balanced by the always present scientists or journalists. This one is all suits in bureaus doing nothing, until it's too late at least. Just like in the real world where the Fukushima disaster was worsened by what is now understood to have been an irresponsible lack of communication between different sectors of the Japanese government which culminated in a delayed response to the crisis, most of the characters from the movie spend a lot of time not knowing what to do with the emergency at hand, a fact not helped by the choking bureaucratic machine that surrounds them. <laughs> Both factors contribute to the pen taking way too long to deal with Godzilla, by which time he had already grown into an unstoppable force of destruction. But that's only the tip of the iceberg of social commentary in this movie. There is also commentary on the mostly unilateral relationship between the US and Japan, Japanese society attitudes of age outweighing ability, their relationship with defense forces and the fear of remilitarization, responsibility, the irresponsible way humans treat nuclear waste, yeah, this movie has layers to it, which is honestly something weird to be said about a Godzilla movie. It's safe to say Shin Godzilla shoots in a lot of directions, to an almost overwhelming degree, I must say. It's kind of hard to keep track of everything that the movie is trying to convey, especially if you are not familiar with modern Japanese society. And for this very reason, I may not be the best person to say what I'm going to say, but the way the movie treats such discussions are mostly hit or miss. It's frustrating to watch as the characters bicker over problems that really shouldn't be problems at all, like whether they should or not shoot the giant monster rampaging through the city. Yeah, I get that this reflects the crippling fear Japan has of mobilizing its military either out of worry of international reaction or of a remilitarization, but really? This is not a regular natural disaster, guys. No one in their right mind would condemn you for doing what you had to do. This is the metaphor getting in the way of the actual narrative, which thankfully doesn't happen all that often in the movie, actually. Even if there are times in which the story feels bloated, it nevertheless completely sells the feeling of helplessness before a disaster that could have been completely avoided had the proper actions been taken. Shin Godzilla absolutely succeeds in conveying its main themes of responsibility and disaster, culminating in what is probably the darkest and most cynical movie of the franchise to date, and all that thanks to image and text neatly working together. The film evokes images of real-world tragedies in order to give its story and subject more depth. I mean, the 2014 Godzilla also did have quite a few images evocative of the 2011 earthquake, but in that case they're just there, you know, they mean nothing in the great scheme of things. Here these images serve a larger purpose. Speaking of images, Shin Godzilla is easily the prettiest and most well executed of the bunch. It has a very tight direction that makes good use of the direction's anime sensibilities. I talked quite a lot by now of how the millennial era of Godzilla movies indulged itself of anime tropes and visual cues, but Shin really takes it a step further with a blocking and, most of all, editing style visibly reminiscent of that of anime. Also, lots and lots and lots and lots of talking. 
It's like a live action anime. And the special effects are quite top notch too, considering this is a Japanese production. There is a nice mixture of practical and digital effects that showcase Shinji Higuchi's craft and desire to bring the kaiju genre into the 21st century. Which meant hiring a man to awkwardly walk around pretending he's a 100 meter tall lizard and turning this into a sometimes weird move in digital Godzilla. Never motion capture giant monsters, they already look goofy enough. When Shin Godzilla reached theaters of Japan in 2016, it instantly became a smashing success. It was the second highest grossing movie of that year in the country, and the biggest box office the franchise had ever seen, period. It was critically praised all across the board, and its success was further cemented in March of the following year when it won Best Picture at the Japanese Academy Award. They have one of these? One of the reasons Hideaki Anu was so reluctant in taking on this project was that he didn't believe being able to do something that was up to the original Godzilla movie. Well, if my opinion is worth something, he not just reached the first film's level of quality, but maybe even surpassed it. It's a powerful reimagining of the series' origin that resonates with modern Japan in a way deeper than even the 1954 flick ever did back then. Shin Godzilla proved itself to be a remarkable film, and certainly one of the greatest achievements of an aging franchise that nonetheless proves again and again being able to connect itself to the present and reflect the society that gave birth to it. A franchise that had very high highs and some pretty low lows and yet it still managed to keep on captivating audiences around the world with its fantasy hijinks that were at times silly, at times scary, at times thrilling, but always capable of endearing our imagination. It's a franchise that has morphed to almost unrecognizable degrees over time to guarantee its survival for 65 years, and as far as anyone is concerned, we remain here for much longer, because as long as humanity keeps fucking shit up, Godzilla will show up again and again to point out the folly of man. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the Godzilla retrospective. It's been a long road with a fair share of bumps. Not all those moments were pleasant, I must admit, but your support and encouragement made me keep going with this project. So I have nothing but gratitude to all of you who are watching right now, either if you are a longtime fan or if you have just discovered the channel. Thank you for staying with me this long and rest assured that I will keep making contact. But before, there's something that has to be done. Why are you here? Because I hate him. Why are you here? Because I hate him. Is it him that you hate? Or your inability to love him? I'm pretty sure it's him that I hate. But you hate him because you love him. What? No! What are you, stupid? You are stupid! Stupid is to hate on a person that doesn't exist only because I feel bitter about the quality of the movies in which he takes part! Well, the movies were awful. But does that make him awful? I suppose. Or are you just venting your frustrations on him? I don't know. Yes, you do. Maybe I've been a little too hard on him. The one you were the hardest with was you. What do you mean? You must allow yourself to love again. But how do I start? With him. I can't do it. Yes, you can. How? It starts with an epiphany. But I'm afraid. Afraid of what? I'm afraid of admitting, admitting what I really feel. These feelings have been shackling me for so long. I don't know what I will do if I get rid of them. Get rid of him. Because I actually need him. I'm afraid of admitting that I actually love him and need him in my life. I was afraid, but no more. I can't live with this fear any longer. I want to live with you. Because, because I love you, Minila. I love you and I need you. Congratulations! Parabéns. Parabéns. Bom assim, Gi. Muitos parabéns. 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 
Thank you all. Fly me to the moon and let me dance among the stars. Let me see what spring is like at Jupiter and Mars. In other words, please be true. In other words, I love you. Now what?